Australia is unique. 85% of our marine life here, you can't see it anywhere else in the world. After 20 years of diving, I'm still moved by it. Tonight, putting on the brakes. We've got to get uh, this right um, because, let's face it, the cost of petrol underpins most things that families do. The government introduces a fuel watch scheme forcing companies to publicise prices in advance. This will be a controversial scheme uh, and retailers may uh, feel that this is uh, not appropriate for them. And the government has to determine what the best me mechanism is to make this market work for everybody. The battlers who are filling up early in the week are likely to lose the discounting that they get early in the week. Good evening, welcome to Late Line, I'm Lee Sales. Unions played a pivotal role in last year's election of the Rudd government with their relentless campaign against John Howard's workplace reforms. They backed their anger with a $20 million television blitz, but their efforts on behalf of the political wing of the Labor movement haven't attracted new members, in fact, the opposite. Union memberships plummeted by 5%, even as the anti-work choices campaign was underway. Now, fewer than one in five Australians are union members. To talk through that and other labour market issues, we'll be joined tonight by AC2U President Sharon Burrow. That's coming up, but first, our other headlines. Winning the whaling war. Protesters claim a victory as Japan admits its catch quota was well down. The Burke effect. New rules aimed at keeping politicians at arm's length from lobbyists. And on late line business, insurance premium. IAG rejects a multi-billion dollar takeover bid from rival QBE. The federal government warns it's no silver bullet, but it's hoping a new national fuel watch scheme will help curb soaring petrol prices. The scheme will force petrol stations to lock in their fuel prices every afternoon and stick to them for the whole of the next day. The Prime Minister says it'll lend a helping hand to struggling families. But Kevin Rudd has again been forced to remind China that its helping hand, in the form of security for the Olympic torch relay, isn't needed on the Australian leg next week. From Canberra, Kieran McKechnie reports. Wherever he goes, Kevin Rudd just can't escape controversy over the Olympics. The Prime Minister's repeatedly insisted Chinese security officials won't have a role in guarding the Olympic torch when it arrives on Australian soil next week. But that's where he's at odds with Olympic organisers. They're certainly with the torch on agreement with uh, local authorities and uh, I see no problem with that. Under no circumstances, no matter what occurs, will they be called upon to perform a security function. Thus says the ACT police. And with that, Kevin Rudd says that's the end of the matter. Today he was also trying to douse another burning issue, soaring petrol prices. We can't promise the world, we can't promise the impossible, but we think this extends a helping hand to working families trying to balance the family budget. By the end of the year, a national fuel watch scheme will be up and running, designed to keep petrol prices in check. Under the scheme, oil companies will be forced to lock in petrol prices for the following 24 hours. That information will then be passed on to motorists. You can either sit around and do nothing about this and just say, woe is me, petrol prices are going up globally, there you go. Or uh, you can do something. And based on the WA experience, this seems to be a step in the right direction. Um, but it's no silver bullet to global prices uh, on oil. The battlers who are filling up early in the week are likely to lose the discounting that they get early in the week. Though the battlers should take heart from new assurances on inflation from the Reserve Bank Governor. It needs to be dealt with and it is being dealt with and uh, I think the policies in place uh, will succeed in, in bringing it back down over time. Releasing its minutes from this month's meeting, the RBA notes the reserve and private bank increases were exerting a significant restraint on both households and businesses and that inflation would fall by a little more than earlier thought over the next two to three years. Labelled heartless and insensitive for last month telling mortgage holders it's just life that the big banks are raising their rates beyond the official figure. Today, Glenn Stevens tried a more measured approach. I know that. Uh, mortgage holders in many instances are doing it tough. If we don't control inflation, they would do it much, much tougher in time. 
His critics put on notice. Kieran McKechnie, Lateline. He's had the hair transplant and the facelift. Now Silvio Berlusconi is planning a makeover for Italy. He's back in power for a third time after clinching a decisive win in the country's general election. Italy's minor parties were the big losers. More than 150 contested the poll and their poor performance signals a more simplified political system. The serious losers are the smaller parties which have been completely squeezed by, by both of the bigger parties and almost completely wiped out. The billionaire businessman has warned of tough times ahead as he tries to kickstart the country's ailing economy. In New Zealand, five teenagers have been killed and at least two others are missing after they were swept away in a swollen river. The high school students were taking part in an outdoor education course in the centre of the North Island. Police say the students became caught in rising waters caused by a storm while they were canyoning down the river. Japan's whaling fleet has returned home from this year's hunt with just over half its planned quota of 1,000 whales. Anti-whaling campaigners say their campaign of disruption in the Southern Ocean is responsible for the lower haul. Whalers acknowledge the negative impact of the protests but say it wasn't the only reason for the smaller catch. Tokyo correspondent Shane McLeod reports. Japan's whaling fleet was meant to return to port this season with its largest catch in decades. The largest, in fact, since the moratorium on commercial whaling took effect in 1986. But of the 1,000 whales in the sights of the harpoons, just over 500 were killed. Japan's whalers won't acknowledge that as a victory for anti-whaling protesters. We received extreme interference, but we completed our research whaling regardless. Confrontations in the Southern Ocean summer lost the fleet 31 days of whaling. Plans to catch up to 50 fin whales were abandoned because the whalers couldn't find enough of them to hunt. The only whales caught were minke whales, and Japan says numbers of them appeared to be down too. It suspects a boom in numbers of humpback whales may be to blame. The anti-whaling protesters who confronted the Japanese fleet say the result is a vindication. They're already plotting their tactics for next summer. Sea Shepherd is planning a second boat to tail the fleet with the goal of stopping any whales from being killed. It was a very, very, very successful year uh, for us. And, uh, you know, although, as I said before, this is, a, this is a time to celebrate, but it's also a time to maintain pressure on the Japanese government and, of course, uh, continue working on the ship and, and preparing it to go back down south and face them again. Japan wants to pursue criminal charges against the protesters. It's launched a police investigation to try to identify those responsible. There's no doubt at all that a lesser number of whales killed will be seen as good news by all Australians. The Oceanic Viking, the ship chartered by Australia's government to watch this year's hunt, has also been the target for Japanese criticism. The ship they deployed was big and came very close. Therefore, we felt it was overbearing and high pressure. While we were whaling or tracking or transferring whales, they came very close. We radioed to warn them repeatedly because they were dangerous. The main problem for Japan could be financial. The whaling program is meant to be self-funding, with money from the sale of meat going towards the annual hunt. The reduced catch could mean higher prices for whale meat, making an already unpopular dish even less attractive. The whalers say they have no plans to abandon their whaling program and are planning for next year's hunt in the Southern Ocean. Shane McLeod, Late Line. A series of car bombs have killed at least 56 people in Iraq. In the deadliest attack, 40 people died and 70 more were injured when a suicide bomber blew up a car outside a provincial government office in Bakabar in the north of the country. And in Ramadi, west of Baghdad, 13 people were killed in a blast outside a restaurant. In the United States, Barack Obama has spent a fourth day defending his comment that small-town Americans cling to religion and guns because they're bitter. His Democratic and Republican opponents smell blood. They're calling him elitist and out of touch. The relentless attacks prompted a fierce response from the young senator, as Mark Simkin reports. A multi-millionaire is wooing blue-collar workers. The former first lady is sculling beer, scoffing pizza, shooting whiskey and reminiscing about hunting trips with her father. People enjoy hunting and shooting because it's an important part of who they are. Barack Obama fired back. Hillary Clinton's out there, you know, like she's out in the duck blind every Sunday. 
She's packing a six-shooter. Come on. The brawl began when Barack Obama said blue-collar Americans were frustrated with their economic conditions. His Democratic and Republican opponents pounced, repeatedly accusing the Harvard graduate of being elitist. I don't think he really gets it that people are looking for a president who stands up for you and not looks down on you. She knows better. She knows better. Shame on her. Working class voters are a key constituency in Pennsylvania, the next big primary. But some analysts think Hillary Clinton is getting carried away. Can you just talk about when the last time you fired a gun was and the last time you went to church? You know what? Th that, is not, that is not a relevant question for this debate. One thing Hillary Clinton does think is relevant is electability. She says John Kerry and Al Gore lost because voters thought the candidates were out of touch. The other issue here is familiarity. Barack Obama's a first-term senator and the voters don't know that much about him. Consider this contribution from a media executive. Where the Taliban has been gaining strength and Obama bin Laden is still at large. I think that was Osama bin Laden. Barack Hussein Obama's repeatedly denied claims he's Muslim. Mark Simkin, Laceline. There was a glimmer of sunshine today for families struggling with mortgages and bills. As we heard earlier, the Reserve Bank Governor Glenn Stevens signalled that interest rates may be on hold and the Prime Minister announced a plan hopefully offering some relief from high petrol prices. Despite the concerns about whether the global economic downturn might make life even tougher for Australian families, there's no sense that they're turning to unions for help. Figures released by the Bureau of Statistics show that union membership is in terminal decline, with only 14% of workers in the private sector now paying their dues. And it's a tide that's going to be difficult to turn around. So to discuss that and a range of other issues, I've been joined in the studio tonight by the President of the Australian Council of Trade Unions, Sharon Burrow. Thank you very much for coming in. Good evening, Lee. When we're talking about figures like one in five people belonging to a union, isn't it fair to say that for most Australians, the culture of unionism, of belonging to a union, is already dead? Oh, not at all. We're uh, very optimistic. If you think about the last 11 years, We've had the most serious attack ever in Australia's history on the rights of working people. That's been combined, of course, with work choices which uh, generated a pervasive fear when employers were actively saying, you can't work here if you belong to a union, sign the contract or you don't get the job. You combine that with the changing nature of the economy. And uh, frankly, while we know we've got work to do, particularly with young people and with casual workers, we're pretty optimistic, having come through that uh, dreadful attack, the complexities of the economy, relatively unscathed, still the largest single democratic movement. And our research tells us, Lee, that for every union member, there's another one out there that would consider joining if they knew which union covered their occupation and indeed how to get in touch with it. So that's our task. But if you look at the figures, the decline in union membership started well before the election of the Howard government. Why do you think that is the case? We saw, uh, in some ways, us being a victim of our own uh, cooperation in terms of uh, the multi-skilling agenda in the early 90s, ending those occupational demarks, helping to uh, restructure the Australian economy, the accord years, the demise of manufacturing uh, in terms of its numerical, if not economic, value, uh, and hopefully uh, that'll be turned around too. Those things certainly added up. Students were staying at school longer, we saw uh, the lack of apprentices being taken on uh, through public utilities as they were privatised. But you know what, in the, it, from 2000 on, we actually saw it bottom out and turn around somewhat. We have taken a hit in the last year or so, but again, not surprising. Work choices was the most vicious attack on people's lives in terms of rights at work and their livelihoods and their job security. And uh, we think that fear will uh, now dissipate as we see rights at work reinstated. We uh, have launched uh, a, uh, a tool to help us with uh, a one-stop shop, Unions Australia, 1300 for Union. We'll find the union for you. We'll help track people through now what's uh, 
a multiplicity of jobs and uh, we are actually very optimistic about the next uh, few years. But you mentioned how difficult that work choices period was for you. People mm. were obviously worried enough then about their jobs that they were willing to toss out the Howard government but they weren't willing to join unions. What hope have you got now of getting people to join unions if they wouldn't join then now that there's a relatively benign Labor government in power? Well this survey was taken last October, uh, last August at the height of the fear <clears throat> that work choices generated throughout Australia. Sign the contract or you don't get the job. But in job. terms of turning it around now, and, how are you going to do that? And the research we've done in the last few weeks, Lee, actually shows us that people are very warm about unions. They believe overwhelmingly that uh, when unions bargain collectively with workers, you get a better deal in the workplace. They absolutely, again, overwhelmingly, 80% 80, 80 plus say that they want unions to uh, stand up and run campaigns uh, around government decisions to protect rights and we know again that people are very warm about unions and it, as I said for every one uh, union member there's another one out there that tells us they're considering joining and would do so if they just knew where to go. Even, so, even if they did that though there would still only be two in five Australians who would be members of a union. Isn't the problem partly on you because if you were providing a relevant worthwhile service wouldn't people be lining up to join? We've got one in four permanent full-time workers in the union movement. We're not doing as well with casualised workers although women are joining uh, in much greater numbers who are casual workers and we've clearly got to focus on the difficult environment for young people. There's more than 500,000 young people in Australia not in work, not in education or study. That's uh, a product of a whole range of complexities through the 90s into the uh, noughties and uh, absolutely got work to do. But no one can tell me that 1.8 plus million Australians who understand that, that their commitment to stand up for each other, to uh, stand up for their kids and their grandkids is a small base on which to build a future. It's certainly not the majority, it's, it's far from it. No, but show me another democratic, organisation that uh, has such a deep set of values that they can turn around an election campaign fighting for rights at work, fighting for fundamental rights at work and uh, if you're challenging us about do we have work to do, yes we do. Unions Australia are a one-stop shop determined to get out there and recruit, determined to actually uh, build that uh, base of young people to hand over to but have, uh, have we been through probably the worst period of attacks on working uh, rights in our history? Yes we have and we've come out the other side with a very strong, very optimistic base and standing in good stead both in terms of the public's respect for our uh, commitment, our professionalism and indeed our expertise. That's pretty good. I looked up some union dues earlier. A teacher in New South Wales on about $50,000 pays an annual fee of just over $600 for union membership. A nurse in Victoria on a similar salary pays almost $500. That is a lot of money in these times. Is the cost of union membership too high? Is that something you need to look at? Well, it's not something coming through our research. Of course, we're conscious that it often is for casual workers or for young uh, people. And there are staggered fees depending on the union, the occupation or the profession. But, uh, but we do know that uh, it's an issue that we should watch. With 75% of Australians telling us that they're struggling, that's Australian households, telling us that they're struggling to keep their heads above water, then clearly everything is a cost factor. For single mums, every extra dollar counts. For people, uh, you know, struggling in and out of work, every extra dollar counts. And for those uh, um, workers who are hoping for a minimum wage increase, $26 is our claim uh, in just a month or so down the track. Every dollar will count. So, of course, it's something we should be conscious of. Would you it's, consider cutting your dues? Well, we would certainly consider, uh, and unions do consider, flexibility. But uh, right now, that's not an issue that is tracking for us. But if it does, and certainly uh, if someone came to a union or to the ACTU and said, I can't pay my dues, we'd be much kinder than the banks, I'm, I can tell you. The unions have been credited um, with helping deliver, deliver Labor government. Given your assistance, are you getting enough payback now? Look, we don't expect any special treatment. Uh, we fought. Oh, you must want some sort of payback. Well, we payback. want them to deliver rights at work. That's what we fought for. We've always taken a stand around uh, the uh, issues that working people are thinking are important. When you come to the budget uh, this year, we think it will lay the foundations uh, for rebuilding the decent Australia that I grew up in, an expectation that you could uh, get an education 
without uh, having to depend on how much your parents had to pay, the sense of opportunity that life would be more equitable, childcare, aged care, uh, the uh, Medicare uh, environment, much more universality. There's a lot of work to do out there. So anything that we can see out of a government from its promises to relieve the pressure on working families will support. And of course, by the end of the year, we want to see uh, the promises around rights at work, not just the end of AWAs that we have celebrated, but in fact, uh, collective bargaining rights. Everybody knows that collective bargaining rights uh, are the key to a more equitable society to a better deal at work and when you've got profits going like that relative to wages share, an all-time high over three decades, then people want a bit more of the share of the pie and we'll have to figure out how to do that in the context of uh, a strong set of rights by year's end. Under the previous government the right to strike was severely curtailed. Would you like to see some relaxation of that now? Well we expect that people will have a good faith bargaining system and that means when uh, bargaining breaks down, protected action should absolutely be available. We would want to see a robust dispute settling mechanism. That means that when you strike a deal, it will be respected by employers or their strong prosecution, or alternatively, uh, an ongoing capacity to prosecute it through action. We've already uh, indicated that uh, we will uh, continue to work with the government to see their policies put in place. We expect that there'll be pushback from employers who are still on that profit trajectory and uh, so you'll see us beef up the Rights at Work campaign. We will be talking to the Australian community about the uh, benefits of collective bargaining. They already know that that's in their interest, that they're stronger standing together, they'll get a better deal and of course those unfair dismissal protections comes up number one every time. People are still very worried about job security and why wouldn't they be when they're struggling just to pay their rent or their mortgages? let alone those fuel costs or food or petrol. All right, let's have a look at a few other issues. You're attending the 2020 summit on the weekend and you want to raise the issue of banks. Are you advocating the re-regulation of the banking sector? What we're arguing is that it needs to be looked at seriously. If you've got a situation where notwithstanding the deregulation of banks and a little bit of flexibility on mortgage products, the banks just levied a whole range of other fees and transaction costs that means there's no transparency, no clear contractual arrangements and there's no consumer-based competition. The UK and Europe have indeed put consumer policy at the heart of economic uh, policy and that means that it's not just about uh, the uh, um, supply side and where the companies are competing but it's about the demand side and where the customers get a fair deal. We want to see banks take a little bit more of uh, the risk. They've simply offset their risk of, uh, of uh, profit by defaulting on mortgages, by raising rates. We want to see their share a little more clearly uh, articulated, but we all also want to see some greater, producti uh, some greater uh, creativity around protecting families. Shared equity will be a feature of the mortgage environment within five years, not just for key workers who can't afford to buy into uh, housing now, our kids, Gen Xs, Gen Ys, but indeed for those who are struggling at the other end. So a lot more responsibility from banks and certainly a look at the regulatory environment so we don't see the traumas that uh, working families are currently facing. The Treasurer Wayne Swan was initially quite vocal in his criticism of the banks and that seems to have dissipated a, a little in recent times. Do you think the federal government has put enough pressure on banks? Look, it's a difficult area because on the one hand you want to get the regulation right but of course banks are central to uh, a strong economy We've been critical as well. I remain critical about some of their uh, practices, but we've uh, uh, spoken with the Bankers Association. We've asked them to uh, initiate a dialogue to see if we can't get a set of responsible lending practices agreed so people know what the bank's charter is. We want to have a look at the regulatory environment and that's a role for government. There will be a review and clearly that'll be uh, a robust discussion. And we want to see banks look at uh, where we can generate a much more sympathetic and creative environment like that that you see in uh, countries like uh, the Netherlands, in Scandinavia, where it's almost a social crime to see people default on a mortgage. And then of course in terms of the rental hikes, well we've got to look at affordable housing policy. That's certainly in the government's hands and you've seen a commitment to that. 
Tomorrow, along with some others, you're going to be announcing a policy aimed at tackling the skills shortage in Australia. And, and a lot of what you're advocating is to do with increased training and increased education, apprenticeship opportunities, that sort of thing. Those things, sorts of initiatives, take a while to be felt, but there are, are gaps that need to be filled right now. Isn't the only answer to that increased immigration? Look, it's a, it's a balanced uh, outcome we need to see. Tomorrow we will stand uh, together with uh, the AI group, uh, uh, Group Training Australia, the Dusseldorf Foundation, the ACTU and uh, the teachers through the AEU and say this is the critical issue economically, socially. We know that unless we can do something about uh, skills both immediately, as you say, and into the future, we will face uh, by, uh, um, you know, 2025 billions of dollars loss to the economy. So the government's promised a lot of places, but we need to back that in with a whole range of other industry-led strategies about where the priorities are. What we do about young people, our apprentices earn as little as eight dollars an hour. How can you uh, have a wealthy country that's uh, prepared to impoverish its young people, whether they're on uh, um, junior wages or apprenticeship wages, uh, and uh, not allow them to make a, a wage on which they can live independently? A lot of work to do. Migration's absolutely part of the picture, but bringing um, uh, permanent migration support absolutely from the unions. Temporary migration, if we get the right space in, uh, in place, get rid of the uh, damage that those 457 visas that they're currently constructed have done, that, that'll be a good thing. But you can't have that without the commitment from business to actually train the future workforce. Otherwise, it's just a self-fulfilling uh, uh, prophecy that you're never going to have a capacity to meet the skills deficit. And with those young people needing jobs, we've got a workforce out there that's willing to be trained. We're out of time. Sharon Burrow, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you, Lee. Tomorrow, submissions close for the Federal Government's draft code of conduct for lobby groups. The code will force professional lobbyists to register on an official list and record their meetings with ministers and senior government bureaucrats. The new rules for lobbyists come after a murky period for the ALP involving West Australian Labor heavyweight Brian Burke. This week's Four Corners program also revealed that building developers have been making big donations to the New South Wales Labor Party to try to fast track property developments. But some critics say the draft code of conduct doesn't go far enough. Others say it goes too far. John Stewart reports. Lobbying is big business, whether it's defence, pharmaceuticals, communications or the retail sector. The big end of town uses professional lobbyists to make sure it gets heard in Canberra. Ben Oquist is a lobbyist who knows the ins and outs of Parliament House. He represents union and environment groups. Good lobbyists increasingly uh, operate more than just door openers, but really give tr strategic advice to their clients about how to make a politician or a decision maker receptive to their message. But it's the shady side of lobbying that's become a concern for the Rudd government. Last year the Labor Party became caught up in a murky story about the former West Australian Premier Brian Burke and his attempts to get, amongst other things, a $300 million beach resort approved. Last night's Four Corners program revealed that building developers gave large donations to the New South Wales Labor Party to get access to government ministers. The Federal Labor Party wants to distance itself from the odour emerging from New South Wales and the Burke Affair. The Special Minister of State, John Faulkner, has formed a draft code of conduct for lobby groups. The key features include a register of lobbyists and details of their meetings with federal ministers, parliamentary secretaries and government workers. An 18-month ban on retiring ministers and parliamentary secretaries working as lobbyists. And a 12-month ban on senior advisers, senior defence force personnel and public servants becoming lobbyists. The Greens and Democrats support the steps towards greater transparency in government but are quick to point out that many backbenchers are not included in the draft lobby code. Far too many parliamentarians are left out from it. I mean, legislation is decided by parliamentarians, not decided by the government, uh, and therefore lobbying of those who hold the balance of power or backbench committees or anything of that sort is, is a very uh, important uh, area for regulation. 
Another group that slipped through the net are churches and religious groups which can lobby politicians without recording their meetings on the lobby register. It's given religious pressure groups a uh, opportunity to lobby and influence the passage of legislation through our secular parliament that other groups don't have. And uh, it's demonstrably wrong and that ought to be changed. Like the churches, unions and professional associations are also excluded from the draft lobby code. We're concerned about the unfettered uh, uh, rights of the unions because they are uh, exempt from the code. Uh, and we saw the recent example of the MUA at, uh, at the lodge with the, uh, with the Prime Minister. For the Greens, the 18-month ban on ministers and parliamentary secretaries becoming lobbyists is not long enough. I think it should be banned. It's as simple as that. If you become a member of parliament, you give up the right, after you've left the parliament, to accept money from people to come and influence a parliament using uh, contacts that you've gained over your time of service to the wider electorate. But Liberal Senator Michael Ronaldson says that's over the top. For example, if uh, Wayne Swan was uh, moved out of his portfolio in a reshuffle, uh, his staff potentially are excluded uh, from going to the private sector and doing any work in that area. Now, we think that's very unfair uh, on ministerial staff. Despite the reservations among senators, most professional lobbyists welcome the new code. It will be a really good thing. It will be good for the industry, for businesses, providing a, a level playing field, good for their clients so that they know they're not getting ripped off, and good for the public, that they can have some, some conf confidence in an industry that's often seen as a bit shady. It may also be good for the Labor Party as it tries to put the ghost of Brian Burke and his ilk to rest. John Stewart, Late Line. The Supreme Court in Melbourne has been told that the 2005 AFL Grand Final was the intended target of an attack by an alleged terrorist group. Twelve men are standing trial accused of preparing a terrorist act. Their former associate, Izzy Dina Tick, claimed he'd been told by the group's alleged leader about planned terrorist targets in Melbourne. Emma O'Sullivan reports. Almost 92,000 people attended the AFL Grand Final three years ago. The Supreme Court heard it might have been remembered for different reasons. It heard it was the preferred target of an alleged homegrown terror cell. The evidence came from a former associate of the men, Izzy Dean Attic. The prosecution called him to support their case that the defendants were working towards an attack using weapons or explosives. Mr Attic testified that the alleged leader, Abdul Nasser Ben Bricker told him the plan was delayed because of a lack of funds and because ASIO had raided the homes of some of the men earlier that year. He said Ben Bricker named the 2006 AFL pre-season final and the Crown Casino on the weekend of Melbourne's Grand Prix as subsequent targets. The court also listened to a secretly taped conversation that took place at Ben Bricker's home in 2005. In it, Ben Bricker said to Attic they damage buildings and blast things. Mr Attic gave evidence against several of the accused men. He said that one asked him if he could obtain guns for the group and that another said he was willing to become a suicide bomber for Bembricka. Mr Attic also claimed he carried out credit card fraud to purchase SIM cards and plane tickets. When questioned by Bembricka's defence counsel, Mr Attic confirmed he'd stopped taking medication for schizophrenia. The defence also revealed that the prosecution's star witness had prior convictions for fraud and had been a problem gambler. The trial continues. Emma O'Sullivan, Late Line. The Sydney Swans player Barry Hall has been suspended for seven matches for punching West Coast's, West Coast's Brent Staker during the game on Saturday night. Staker was felled off the ball and Hall's actions have been described by some commentators as the ugliest incident in Aussie rules for some time. The Swans player says the ban's fair. It's like Toe's opportunity to once again apologise to Brent Staker for the, for the incident. Uh, it's unacceptable and um, you know, I'll, I'll try and better myself so that doesn't happen again. Staker's club says he's still suffering headaches and is only a 50-50 chance to play on Sunday. Now to the weather, a shower or two for Sydney and Perth, fine for Melbourne, Brisbane and Hobart and fine and sunny in the other capital cities.
And that's all from us. Late Line Business coming up in just a moment. If you'd like to look back at tonight's interview with Sharon Burrow or, or review any of Late Line stories or transcripts, you can visit our website at abc.net.au slash Late Line. And now Late Line Business with Ali Moore. Thanks, Lee. Tonight, Battle of the Insurers. IAG rejects what it calls an opportunistic and inadequate takeover bid by QBE. We've indicated that we don't think the uh, price offered is in the right area by a long shot and that's where it is today. Central Defender, the Reserve Bank Governor, pledges to safeguard financial stability. But in periods of, un of particularly unusual market duress, central banks should be, as they are, prepared to deal beyond the normal scope of operations to provide liquidity against a broad range of assets. And taxing times, the scope of the GST is tested in the High Court. If this opens up a whole can of worms um, and there are, you know, literally hundreds of supplies in a contract, then it will be very difficult for this. Boosted by that takeover offer for IAG, Australian shares ended a five-day run of losses, closing up more than 1%. The All Lords rebounded 55 points, also helped by oil stocks. The ASX 200 climbed 58 points. In Japan, the Nikkei put on half a percent. Hong Kong's Hang Seng rose by just a third of a percent. And in London, the FTSE is also up strongly. As we said, the board of home and car insurer IAG has rejected a $7.3 billion bid from rival QBE. But with $300 million a year in potential synergies on the table, analysts say the deal makes sense and will probably go ahead with price the only sticking point. And investors agreed, pushing IAG shares 8.5% higher today to $4.19, well above the $4 a share offer. Michael Troy reports. In the last few years, a storm front has swept over the Australian insurance industry. We've seen an awful lot of claims uh, coming through and, and every time we have another disaster, be it floods in, in Mackay or storms in Western Sydney, we see the, the insurance companies uh, being surprised by these events. But in bad times, there are still opportunities. QBE has built its business on the acquisition trail, having successfully made 110 takeovers over the last 25 years. With only 20% of its business here, QBE has made no secret that it's keen to expand domestic operations, and IAG has some of Australia's biggest brands, including NRMA, SGIO and CGU. This morning, QBE revealed it had approached IAG last Friday with a cash and script bid worth around $4 a share. In a statement to the Stock Exchange, Chief Executive Officer Frank O'Halloran said a merger would be transformational for both companies and create an enlarged group which would be in the top 15 global general insurers, with a strong base in personal and commercial lines of business in Australia. The combined company would control 40% of the car insurance market, 42% of home insurance and a third of commercial lines. Market speculation began about four years ago when IAG Chief Executive Officer Michael Hawker was spotted in QBE's Sydney offices. While the current bid has been rejected, it's believed a deal will eventually be made. $4.30, $4.60 will probably secure the IAG board's agreement to this. Um, it's it's a, it is a bit it is sad for IAG shareholders given their shares peaked around $6.90. Um, on the other hand, this should accelerate their wealth accumulation. David Walker, a senior equities analyst from Morningstar, believes QBE will work hard to get an approved bid from the IAG board. Hostile takeovers in financial services are a very bad idea. Uh, it's not possible to know enough about the target's balance sheet from the published accounts. IAG is a takeover target after three straight years of falling profit under Chief Executive Michael Hawker. IAG's share price has slumped dramatically, with $3.2 billion wiped from the company's market capitalisation in 22 months. Well, IAG for the past couple of years has pursued what we think has been a, a very flawed strategy and it's pursued it very aggressively. It's been making acquisitions in Asia, it's been making acquisitions in the UK that so far haven't paid off. Greg Hoffman from The Intelligent Investor believes the merger process is now in train and Michael Hawker should go. IAG will put up a fight, but
but uh, whether it survives or not, well, we'd, we'd prefer to see it not survive in it, under its current leadership. While QBE's initial offer expires on Monday, it's just the first move in what could be a long and protracted battle. And we'll speak with IAG Chairman James Strong later in the program. It wasn't so long ago that the Reserve Bank prided itself on its non-interventionist approach, but times have changed. In an important speech today, Reserve Bank Governor Glenn Stevens laid out a broad strategy of joint government and central bank intervention to deal with any threatened financial institution collapse. At the same time, the latest RBA board minutes also released today show global turmoil was one reason official interest rates did not go up earlier this month, as was mounting evidence of a slowing economy. Here's Philip Lasker. As evidence of an economic slowdown stacks up, the Reserve Bank Governor is becoming more definite about inflation. It's been rising, it's a problem, it needs to be dealt with, and it is being dealt with, and uh, I think the policies in place uh, will succeed in, in bringing it back down over time. It takes a while, but uh, it will work. That more definitive language crept into the RBA boardroom minutes from this month's meeting, which decided to keep interest rates on hold. It was noted that the reserve and private bank increases were exerting a significant restraint on both households and businesses, and that inflation would fall by a little more than earlier thought over the next two or three years. Well, we look for an interest rate cut in uh, late in the December quarter this year. We believe that interest, uh, the domestic economy is going to slow over the course of 2008 and that's going to help alleviate some inflation pressures and actually lower that inflation profile and make the Reserve Bank a little more comfortable that it can open the door to some easing to actually loosen up those financial conditions. And those precarious global financial conditions leading to the collapse of financial institutions like Northern Rock and Bear Stearns have left central banks struggling. My own view, given what we know at present, is that in periods of, un of particularly unusual market duress, central banks should be, as they are, prepared to deal beyond the normal scope of operations to provide liquidity against a broad range of assets and over a longer maturity, if need be, than might normally be considered. But that didn't include lending against risky subprime mortgages or CDOs, except under the most dire circumstances. It does include swift and transparent action by regulators working hand in hand with the government. Any decision to extend support to an institution which was insolvent for systemic or national interest reasons would be one properly taken by a government under advice not by a central bank off its own bat. So is Australia's traditionally non-interventionist central bank now offering to bail out not only banks, but other financial institutions? No, no, bail out's not the sort of language <laughs> that bankers use. What they're saying really is that uh, if you're involved in very risky activities uh, which do not threaten the whole system, then that's your business and we're not having a bar of it. But if you're a financial institution which is very, very important uh, and your asset structure is good, but your liquidity is a crisis, that is all of a sudden you find you just don't have enough cash, then we will come in uh, in various sorts of ways if we think the system as a whole uh, is at risk. The Governor says his comments don't suggest there are any serious problems here, but clearly it's been exercising the mind. Well, for a look at the broader trade on our stock market today, I spoke to stockbroker Marcus Padley. Marcus Padley, we made up some ground today. Uh, yes, not too bad a day. In fact, a very good day, considering Wall Street was down and the futures were down a little bit this morning. Uh, we were up 58. I think we're up 80 at our best. Uh, driven today by everything, really. Resources up, but financials in particular, as we've heard the um, uh, QBE bid for IAG set the insurance sector alight. Uh, he had a couple of little features. Woolworths was down today ahead of third quarter sales results tomorrow. I think people are worrying about their sales growth moderating a little bit. Uh, Wes Farmers as well, who of course recently bought Coles, were also one of the few stocks to go down today. Uh, we also saw oil search up after selling a couple of uh, assets, which will help finance their PNG project. Uh, and we also saw ERA down on the back of production numbers. Uh, and the banks as well, uh, some of them lagging a little bit. All the banks with results coming up 
uh, namely uh, Westpac Bank, ANZ, uh, National Bank, all underperforming a little bit um, relative to the rest of the market. And the CBA, which doesn't have results, uh, had a good day today. So it seems people are a little fearful of the bank's results coming up. ANZ underperforming more than the others? Uh, yes, there's a, a bit of press today about their potential exposure to yet another margin lender uh, that may uh, be close to going oblong, uh, but hasn't done yet. The markets seem polarised, don't they, to a certain extent? Resources versus financials. Are we ever going to see the banks get back to their previous highs? Uh, well, this is, this is uh, becoming quite interesting because I think the uh, results out of the US, which have so far been pretty dismal, uh, particularly overnight, Wachovia uh, fell about 8% on their results. GE fell 12% on their results on Friday. And GE's problem was their finance division. The whole uh, finance business seems to have taken a turn for the worse that's taken them all by surprise in the last couple of months. And it does seem that the financials uh, are really going to have a bit of a hangover uh, from everything that's happened. And although we talk about the bank sector being 36% off its highs, uh, really to talk about the old highs is... Uh, a bit of an irrelevance and we're deceiving ourselves to think they'll get back there because conditions have markedly changed uh, for the banks um, in the last few months. Uh, uh, lending criteria have changed, uh, their, their margins are going to get squeezed by higher wholesale rates because of the credit markets and really they've learnt about the uh, lending with gay abandon uh, which they did in 2007 and to expect everything to return to uh, the gay abandon of 2007 is, is just unrealistic. So uh, we have to lower our sights and therefore lower our hopes of a uh, rapid bounce. Lower hopes in Australia, but if we look at the US and that continuing stream of profit results, particularly in financials, lots of big banks to report this week. Uh, yes, we've got uh, Citigroup, JP Morgan, uh, Merrill Lynch. Uh, uh, we've got some tonight, I think Washington Mutual tonight, US Bancorp. Uh, it's one of the busiest weeks for the US financials this week in results. And uh, you have to assume from the almost 100% uh, hit rate of disappointing uh, so far the results season, which is only a week in, uh, that forecasts are still too high. Uh, results are going to continue to disappoint. We're probably going to see more write downs as well. And this results season is not going to be the catalyst for the bounce. Uh, it presents more of a risk uh, to the recovery than uh, a hope. Um, so uh, a very important week this week, uh, plenty of things to trip over uh, between now and Friday. With that slightly depressing assessment, many thanks for joining us, Marcus Padley. OK, Ali. To the other major movers today on our market, renewable energy company Energy Developments was the day's top performer, jumping nearly 10%. And gaming firms Tats Group and Tabcor both managed to claw back some lost territory. On commodity markets, gold is up over 1%. In New York, crude oil has hit another record high. And on currency markets, after earlier rising on the back of stronger commodity prices, the Australian dollar has lost ground. Goods and Services Tax is at the centre of a landmark case in the High Court. The Tax Office is appealing against an earlier ruling that GST could not be charged on a deposit which had been forfeited in an aborted property deal. The, the case centres around when goods and services are, su are supplied and it could have implications for nearly every business in the country. Andrew Robertson reports. The goods and services tax was introduced in July 2000 as part of the Howard government's attempt to broaden Australia's tax base. It's a tax based on consumption, not income, and for the first time in its eight-year history, the courts are being asked to decide when consumption takes place. It is a hallmark case and it's of great importance to us that uh, we get some sense of context from the High Court of where our tax sits against the international value-added tax model. The case stems from an offer in 2002 to buy the premises of Melbourne-based retailer Reliance Carpets. A $300,000 deposit was paid and when the deal fell through Reliance Carpets kept the deposit but the tax office requested GST. Reliance Carpets refused on the grounds that nothing had been supplied. That's despite the fact that Section 99 of the GST Act specifically says that deposits will be treated as payment for supply of a good or service if they're forfeited. KPMG's Michael Evans, who helped draft that law, says a literal interpretation misses the point. 
if a deposit becomes consideration for something, then at the time it does become consideration for something I've done, then it's taxable. If it never becomes consideration for something I've done, then it doesn't become taxable. Lawyer Gary Chert from Cause Chambers Westgarth is also a GST specialist and also argues that in the Reliance carpet case there was no consumption because nothing was supplied. In Reliance, the supply, the, the sale of the land, was actually unconsummated. It never occurred. And yet, um, we're, we're arguing about whether or not there's a taxable supply. As the case is considered by the High Court, Gary Chert believes business will be facing a big burden if the judges uphold the tax office view. What do we do when we have a commercial arrangement? Um, do we have to dissect that arrangement up into, you know, hundreds of potential supplies? Or can we look at, you know, what is really the underlying commercial substance of the transaction? Um, and I suppose that, that's what uh, Reliance is about. And there are other issues, such as will deposits need to be increased by 10% to cover the GST? And will that put some companies at a competitive disadvantage? Will break fees be taxable, even though they're only paid when nothing is supplied? And what about a lost deposit for a residential house? No GST is currently paid on existing homes. Since the legal process began in the Reliance Carpet case, Europe's highest court has ruled on the same issue, declaring that deposits forfeited when hotel bookings are cancelled are not subject to a goods and services tax. So we have very firm authority for quite a long while in Europe and in other countries that operate value-added taxes that say this isn't an income tax, this is not a tax that taxes a vendor or a businessman because they get money in the course of their business. The payment has to be for something they've done that the consumer is acquiring or buying. The tax office has refused to give any indication of how much revenue is at stake if it loses the Reliance case, but if the High Court rules that way, businesses who've paid GST on forfeit of deposits will be seeking refunds. Back to the battle of the big insurers now and QBE's proposed takeover of IAG made public today was actually the second proposal put to IAG. The first, put late last week, was also rejected immediately. IAG's chairman is James Strong and he joined me from his Sydney office earlier this evening. James Strong, welcome to Late Line Business. Thank you, Ali. You've rejected the price but not the logic of putting these two companies together. IAG is now clearly on the market? I wouldn't use that phrase. We didn't put the company on the market. We were approached by QBE, and I think that's clear from both their statement and ours. So I think that's uh, carrying it a little bit too far, Ali. Um, we obviously responded to some discussions which were not complete or, or uh, on the record at that stage as well. And uh, we've indicated that we don't think the uh, price offered is in the right area by a long shot, and that's where it is today. You say a long shot. What is in the ballpark? Well, that's something that I wouldn't negotiate via the ABC, even though yours is a very good program, Ali. Um, obviously, that's a matter between the parties. But I think people can see, we've pointed out, the relationship between the uh, price offered and the existing price late last week. And I think in terms of um, premium and so on, the market will have given its own indication today as to whether that price was adequate or not and whether there should be a premium. Well, if we look at what happened on the market, you closed up around 9% today. Is that the sort of premium you're looking for? No, I don't think I can comment on that, Ali, because, as I say, we're not pu putting the company up for sale um, and haven't at any stage. They've approached us, so obviously the question of the appropriate pricing is a matter of offers made and then our analysis. But we're like most companies um, on the stock exchange. These days you don't take anything for granted. So we've done a lot of work on what we think our value is to anyone who might want to buy us, uh, whether it was QBE or anyone else. But that's something that the board will keep in its mind. And our whole focus is on what is the best value outcome for our shareholders and as you know we've got a lot of retail holders of our shares so it's a very important obligation. You've made the point today that QBE is taking advantage of your weak share price but there are a couple of points here aren't they? I mean the stock is down about a third and the markets have been exceptionally volatile but you've had six straight profit falls. 
you've had trouble with the UK expansion. You've got a CEO who's been the subject of speculation well before you appointed the former prominent boss Mike Wilkins as Chief Operating Officer. There are reasons that investors have been questioning the strategy or direction of the company. Well, we've been quite upfront at how disappointed we've been at the cycle that we're in. And obviously it's a matter we talked to our shareholders about at the last AGM. Uh, in terms of our management, we were lucky to have a situation where Mike Wilkins was available and I'd just like to re-record that it was Mike Hawker who hired Mike Wilkins and he hired him for the specific uh, reason of increasing our management strength and handing over all of the day-to-day -day operations to Mike Wilkins and that's been affected. They've cooperated very well and they, they, they're a good team together. Um, so the question of the management is, is bedded down now and it's working well. Michael Hawker has your full support. Yes and he has right through. I think you know that Ali and I think for people to say, well, you know, why don't you change that now? Well, that, that would actually be detrimental. We've now got a very good way of spreading the load between those two people. And Mike's got a lot of knowledge and a lot of skills, and uh, so it would be detrimental in my view. It wouldn't do anything. There's nothing that he's done in recent times that's uh, to the detriment of the company. But if you hadn't had the poor profit performance, would you be in this position? I think if we didn't have the cycles of weather and, and pricing, because also the other factor in all of this, which you'd be well aware of, Ali, is that uh, it's, a, it's a very tough cycle in the general insurance industry, in the motor industry, in Australia and in the UK. And I think that that tough cycle's lasted a bit longer than everybody expected, and it's affecting other insurance companies as well. Whereas QBE is in essentially different businesses. They're offshore, they're in long tail business, a lot of commercial property business liability uh, areas. So uh, we're in a different cycle to them because we're in different products and different markets. and. Obviously, they're seeking to take advantage of that and, and uh, that, that, I imagine, is the logic behind their uh, timing. You don't acknowledge that you're any more vulnerable than any other player in this industry? Well, I think the reason, if, if you're asking me to interpret, and I'm sure that uh, everyone who uh, has any knowledge of this area would see that there's a logic in the sense of the complementarity of the two businesses and everybody speculated about this for, I don't know, at least the last six years, Ali, and I'm sure you can recall this being on the cards or on the uh, sort of commentary area for many years. So there's, it's not surprising in that sense that there's a geographical diversity and as you know in insurance, um, how much capital you need and taking advantage of uh, the spread of risk in terms of ge geographical and business type is very beneficial. So there's a certain logic to it and that's why people have speculated about it for a long time. Well, if you accept the logic of this, you know QBE, you know the industry, you know the markets, you're probably not a betting man. But if you look 12 months out, do you think the two companies will be two or one? You got it right, Ali. I'm not a betting man. James Strong, many thanks for talking to Late Line Business. Thanks, Sally. A $3 billion merger is set to create the world's biggest airline. In an all-share offer, Delta Airlines, America's third biggest carrier, will buy a smaller rival, Northwest. Delta says the new airline, which will use its name and employ 75,000 people, will generate over a billion dollars in new revenue and savings. This combination gives Delta Northwest the assets to win in the global marketplace against many foreign flag carriers. We will also be able to invest in our employees, aircraft, and better services for our customers. The deal sealed after a year, sealed a year after both carriers exited bankruptcy protection and is expected to prompt similar moves by other airlines struggling with record fuel prices. Now look at tomorrow's business diary. Takeover target Rio Tinto releases its quarterly production report, as does fellow miner Oxiana. Supermarket giant Woolworths tables its latest sales figures, while financial services group AXA Asia Pacific holds its AGM. 
Overseas and the US reporting season continues, the highlight being first quarter earnings from JP Morgan Chase. Before we go, a look at what's making news in the business sections of tomorrow's papers. The Age says a slump in US consumer spending together with tightening credit markets has triggered a wave of bankruptcies in American retailers. The Australian examines IAG's rejection of QBE's multi-billion dollar